So, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Watson. I'll be telling you about Capsicum, practical capabilities for Unix. I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors, John Anderson, also at the University of Cambridge, uh, and Ben Laurie and Chris Kenaway, who are at Google's London office. Uh, and also to thank uh, Google for their sponsorship. Uh, this work is done collaboratively, uh, including with the FreeBSD project and a number of other open source projects as we tried to kind of explore the space uh, of what was possible here. Uh, the project's been going on for about two and a half years now, so we're kind of at a, a midpoint and a good point to break and, and talk about what we've been up to. Uh, so Capsicum uh, is a hybrid Unix capability operating system, and there have been plenty of hybrids between Unix systems and capability systems before, uh, including uh, Mock, certainly, uh, but also a number of other experiments. What we're interested in uh, is the requirements of complex security-aware applications. These are applications that have their own security models uh, and are trying to do something complicated and interesting, such as uh, map the single origin policy found in the World Wide Web into local security primitives. Uh, and in that sense, uh, this project is somewhat comparable to the previous talk as well. Um, what I'm going to do is tell you a bit about those requirements. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why mandatory access control is not quite what we needed to solve the problem here, since Mac uh, seems to be becoming very popular. Uh, I seem to have helped a little in making it popular uh, in, in various systems, including FreeBSD and Mac OS X, so I take some responsibility for that. Um, but capabilities provide us something new. I'm not going to reason about theoretical expressibility of capabilities in Mac. What I'm going to argue is that capabilities allow us to express something a little better than mandatory access control might allow us to do. I'll tell you about Capsicum's capability mode and capabilities. Uh, we have done a lot of work in Capsicum. There are a lot of operating system changes we've made, new primitives we've added, and I only have a, a few minutes to talk about it. So I'll just stick to the, what I think are the key points. I'll then talk a little bit about how applications interact with sandboxing. And there, I think there's some lessons learned both for how you integrate capabilities, but also some of the other systems that are around uh, where different systems solve problems better and worse. Uh, finally, I'll mention a few ways in which we plan to build on Capsicum in the future. Uh, since we think this is a pretty interesting technology. So in case you missed it somehow in the last two decades, there have been a couple of paradigm shifts. Uh, we've seen a migration from multi-user machines to multi-machine users. Uh, I used to log into a Unix server from my terminal. Uh, now I can carry three different Unix servers you know, in my pocket, in my bag as I walk around. Uh, that's really cool. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's caused some security problems and certainly requires some rethinking. Uh, applications have suddenly become something much more interesting than we were before. Applications used to be these nice bundles of code you got from a vendor, and you installed them, and they kind of did your bidding if it went well. Uh, and if they went badly, uh, then things still kind of mostly worked. Um, today, applications are a portal through which you reach uh, many different competing interests. Uh, you may view web pages using the Facebook application, the same time as you share personal information. Applications are composed out of many parts dynamically as you load web pages. These dots have different trust properties. And so in the context of this one word application, we're trying to reason about many different principles and many different components, all dynamically composed, which is very hard to think about uh, and certainly hard to get right. And I think we would argue the tools that we have are not very good for dealing with that currently. One interesting spot in this big picture of cloud computing and thin clients and workstations and servers uh, is the thin client, because this is the point where a lot of the composition that's interesting happens. Uh, thin clients turn out not to be very thin. They have very large operating system stacks, very complicated web browsers, uh, and they're the place where many of these different security domains all come together. Uh, and so we need to think very carefully about the security that takes place there. So what we've seen in the last decade or two is a, a shift, I think first adoption of discretionary and mandatory access control in commodity computer systems. Uh, in the 1990s, we saw address space separation turn up in commodity computers that appear on people's desktops. That was a pretty nice thing for tech transfer, uh, if only 30 years late. Uh, then we saw discretionary and mandatory access control start to get distributed, especially mandatory access control in the last 10 years. And now we're seeing these tr uh, people trying to use these for sandboxing, which is not really quite what they were intended for, uh, especially when it comes to lots and lots of quite malicious pieces of code all arriving at once. So we've seen kind of a transition there. Um, we've seen this move towards application security. If you're going to have applications that deal with all these parties, application writers will want to think about security, it turns out. This is very encouraging. We would like to help them. Um, and one of the things they do is try to do this mapping from distributed to local security domains, which is a really important problem. And it's one of the areas a lot of our local security tools have failed because they're all written with this idea of multiple local users. Maybe they have labels, maybe we're doing interesting things with information flow, but they're really oriented around a local security problem. And we're very interested in the distributed security problem. Uh, one particular thing I was going to mention, I don't have on the slide, but is relevant in the context of the last talk, uh, is the fact that we need to do this composition of security things inside the application. So we now allow applications to create sandboxes that themselves create sandboxes as we build down more and more code, which is a, a critical requirement. So here's the kind of world we live in. Um, we have the Chromium web browser. Uh, we might visit a bunch of different sites that use very different technologies. We have the uh, traditional World Wide Web with static web pages. 
Uh, we might have a nice sort of JavaScript Web 2.0 email application that deals with our sensitive email. This is actually John's sensitive email, as opposed to mine. Uh, we have the uh, nice YouTube with its Flash uh, plugins, uh, which we'll see her talk about later on how the Flash security model has evolved. Uh, and then we might have some sensitive banking information. Um, this is also John's sensitive banking information. This is a very carefully crafted uh, presentation to preserve my sensitive information. Uh, so lots of complex technologies. We have virtual machines, we have scripting languages, uh, multiple scripting languages, multiple virtual machines. Uh, and if you attack the web browser, what do you get? Well, there are a couple of different possible outcomes. You could jump from one session to another. You might be able to snoop on uh, banking information from the web browser. I send you a nasty email. Uh, that compromises my web browser. It snips my banking information. This is a bad outcome. Um, but you also might be able to get ambient user privilege or rights outside of the web browser, rights to files in the file system and more. And the way we structure our operating systems makes that very easy to do. Uh, so this thing we would argue is a problem. And just to kind of hammer that home, uh, security vulnerabilities can and do happen in web browsers in large quantities. So. It was a project uh, from the late 1980s, early 1990s, the microkernel project, uh, which sought to decompose very large pieces of software into smaller pieces of software to improve robustness and sometimes security. Uh, I think this project sort of semi-succeeded and semi-failed. I think many people think it failed um, because although it improved robustness, it did not improve performance. Uh, but something interesting happened about 10 years later, uh, and this sort of began, I think, in part with Niels Provost's work on SSHD and, and certainly went well beyond that. Uh, and this was this move towards privileged separation in user space applications. It has very much the same goal, to improve security and robustness, uh, usually at the cost of performance. Why is it that this project has succeeded and the previous project failed? I think part of that is because performance has improved, uh, and part of that is because security is being thought of as more critical than it was before. I think this is a really encouraging sign. And so it's in this world that we're interested uh, in the problem of privileged separation uh, and capsicum. Uh, and I think there's a, a comparison to be made in the size of these pieces of software. Uh, a random OS kernel floating around that I measure the size of is about 3 million lines of code. Uh, the Chromium web browser, including many of the built-in components like WebKit, comes to 4 million lines of code. So it's a very comparable kind of project uh, with comparable kinds of problems. So we do actually have some other security solutions around. Uh, so we should talk a little bit about those. Uh, manager access control, of course, is a, is a very interesting technology. And one of the more predominant flavors right now is type enforcement, uh, especially in SE Linux. Uh, and I'm not going to argue that capabilities are more expressive than manager access control. Well, I will say they're slightly more expressive in certain ways, and they reflect some of the concerns that we're interested in better. So, for example, type enforcement uh, and manager access control generally are interested in the interests uh, of the administrator, uh, sometimes the security administrator of machines, sometimes just the administrator. Uh, but when we have a web browser, uh, we're interested in some other parties who want to influence policy, such as application writers who are building pieces dynamically that are getting constructed in the client. Uh, or even the end user of the system. Uh, manager access control sees the user as someone to constrain, and we actually see the user as someone to enable in terms of the ability to express policy. Uh, they'd like to assign rights to applications, and we feel capabilities are a better way to do that. In terms of creating sandboxes and manipulating the policy, uh, if you live in the world of web browsers or Apache web servers, uh, application configuration needs to drive the authoring of new policy, because as the requirements for applications change and are expressed in application-specific ways, the system security policy needs to evolve. Uh, we think that capabilities do this a bit better than type enforcement, which is a flexible system and does allow us to uh, do dynamic transitions and all kinds of things, um, but is, uh, uses a separately formed source of policy, which is a trade-off I'll talk about a little bit later. One of the ideas we're particularly interested in uh, is, the so is application code as a source of policy. So capabilities do a pretty good job at extracting policy from code or at least allowing code to express policy. Uh, we're also interested in the user interface as a source of policy, which is something that traditional manager access control systems have sort of played with a bit in the world of CMWs, but I think not come up with too many uh, convincing solutions. I'll make another observation about type enforcement is that the granularity of type enforcement is very useful and very important, but most of the errors that we found in type enforcement policies, which I'll talk about in a moment as well, uh, came from excessive granularity and the fact that you write very rough, broad, sweeping policies uh, that assign lots and lots of rights at once because it's very hard to isolate the rights you need to assign. So we'll talk a little bit about how capabilities sometimes help and sometimes don't with that problem. Here's a practical example of something that is a little bit hard to do with current manager access control systems. You have a web server. The web server is going to serve a number of virtual domains. And each of those virtual domains represents you know, a security domain. Uh, and what we'd like to do is isolate the loading of pages and the execution of code between those domains. When you edit your apache.conf file uh, or your http.conf file in order to add a new domain, uh, you'd really like the security properties in the operating system to track that configuration change. Uh, in type enforcement systems, you'll be going off and modifying the global type enforcement policy and rebuilding it and, and reloading it and so on. Uh, 
But what we really want to have happen is that Apache reads the configuration file and says, oh, here are my various uh, domains. I'd like to create sandboxes for them or, or execution environments that reflect the isolation requirements of the application. It isn't to say you couldn't combine the two, but I think capabilities provide a better way to structure this. So what is a capability system? Well, this is a computer that sits down the hall from me at the University of Cambridge. This is the CAP computer. Uh, capability hardware was very popular, 1970s. A lot of very interesting ideas came out of that. As we go into the 1980s and microkernels, uh, capability concepts map from things that appear in hardware into things that appear in message passing. Uh, and some of the microkernel systems take a very capability-oriented approach. Uh, capability is a very delegation-centric. Essentially, if you hold the capability to an object, you have the right to access the object. You can pass the capability around to other parties, uh, and then they gain the right to access it. Uh, and so it's very structured around delegation. Um, many systems use ideas from capabilities, including Unix, and we take advantage of that. Uh, but they don't use it as a central design philosophy. And one of the key design philosophies of capability systems was that the only way to access something or gain a right to it is to have it delegated to you. And of course, in Unix systems, a central concept is that you can access global namespaces to get access to, uh, to objects. So if you want to play with capabilities today, you kind of have two places you can start. Uh, you can start uh, with existing uh, Unix systems and Windows systems, Mac OS X, Linux, and so on. Uh, these are really great. They have huge application stacks that you can work with immediately to explore the security impact of your changes. What does it mean for application writers? Uh, on the other hand, they have kernels that are not high assurance, microkernels designed around capabilities. Uh, on the other side, we have a number of research systems based on capabilities that have really excellent, least privileged design. They have very carefully crafted IPC systems, uh, all kinds of work on accounting that are really quite interesting. However, they have no extant application stacks. Uh, and what we were interested in doing is exploring how applications interact with capabilities, so we wanted to work with an existing application stack. Uh, so what we've chosen to do uh, is start with FreeBSD. And the goal here is to combine some immediate security benefits with a long-term plan that allows us to adopt capabilities throughout the system if we decide that's the right thing to do. To consider this an experiment to allow us to explore the space, um, but with the possibility of doing more in the future. So here's the worldview we have, and this is very similar to the privileged separation pictures that we've been seeing for the last decade. Uh, in the old world order, we have something that we refer to as a traditional Unix application. It runs with ambient authority, or the ability to access all the objects the user or the process normally has the right to access. Uh, this is subject to discretionary and mandatory access control. And in the new world order, we have logical applications that are made up of a series of processes. And before Capscom came along, we'd use various sandboxing techniques uh, to contain uh, the various renderer processes in Chromium, for example. Uh, and in Capsicum, we put these in what we call capability mode, which means that they have access to many of the facilities that are available in Unix, but we've denied them all access to global namespaces, including the file system namespace. This means they can operate only with the rights that have been delegated to them. So essentially, uh, these are operating uh, as though they were a capability system. And so now what we'd like to do is think about how we structure that restriction and how we handle delegation. Uh, Unix uh, does not... It has file descriptors, which are sort of capabilities, um, but they have some downsides that aren't quite right for capability systems. So we'll talk some more about that. Uh, this is kind of a pragmatic view. Uh, we're not going to introduce perfect capabilities or a perfect capability system. Instead, we're going to allow the two to live side by side. Um, and we're going to provide capabilities for system objects. Unix already contains the facilities to do capabilities for user space objects because it contains IPC primitives, which have worked pretty well for this in the past. Unix isn't great for that, but it does it, it, does it all right. So we're going to focus on the kernel capabilities. Um, there are some ways in which our capabilities are not fully featured in a true capability system sense. For example, uh, we don't support arbitrary interposition of all operations on kernel-provided capabilities, which leads to some design downsides that we'll talk about as well. So we implement this thing called capability mode. We've added a new system call, cap enter, which simply sets a credential flag that once it's set cannot be removed, and it will be inherited by all children processes. So once a process has entered the capability half of the system, uh, it is there to stay, although it can talk to things outside of a capability world. Uh, we've restricted access to a bunch of global operating system namespaces. I think primarily the file system namespace will be of interest to people, but Unix has a lot of global namespaces, and we've enumerated a few of them in the paper. Uh, these include other IPC namespaces that are global. For example, System 5 IPC, uh, usually a very good way to escape from current sandboxing techniques based on discretionary access control because most systems don't actually do that through the file system, even though everything is a file. It's not always a file. Uh, we use interface thinning in some cases. We simply eliminate the ability to access certain system calls. Um, but other system calls, we do uh, deeper constraints inside the kernel. And the reason for that is that there are some kinds of semantic constraints uh, that require you to look at the contents of the arguments to figure out what the request is and maybe transform it somehow. But we have to do it deep inside the kernel, uh, otherwise we suffer from concurrency vulnerabilities. And we actually have a, a separate talk we gave at uh, ASA uh, application 
security analysis or API security analysis workshop about a month ago in Edinburgh on using model checking to explore some of the concurrency issues that arise when you do the sorts of things that we're doing. So that's kind of the principle of the thing. Um, let me talk about a couple of example system calls. Um, open, we block. Open is a, manipulates the global file system main space. It might create a file, it might just open a file. We just don't allow that at all. Uh, but we also do some more complicated things. Uh, for example, uh, we do allow the open at system call. For those of you who haven't followed Unix APIs lately, open at allows you to pass in a starting directory descriptor rather than starting with the current working directory or the root of the file system. So you can say open relative to this location. Uh, it was added for performance reasons. It allows you to avoid iterating over large parts of the file system. It doesn't just generate less work. It keeps fewer things in the cache from the root of the file system, which is pretty good. Um, so we reuse this in environment to allow us to do directory capabilities, uh, which are a whole talk on themselves in terms of uh, how you implement that. Often, we use normal Unix file descriptors. These provide a lot of the behavior that we want, the ability to assign the right to operate on a file. Uh, but we found there are a number of cases where we needed something more refined. Uh, in particular, if you have a series of nested sandboxes and a parent sandbox has read-write access to a file, you might want to allow it to delegate read access to another sandbox without reopening the file. So we want to be able to refine the writes that exist already. Uh, there are some other writes in Unix uh, which require some thinking about. For example, uh, if you have a file descriptor open for read, uh, it's true you cannot issue uh, the write file system call on it, but you can issue the fchmod file system call on it and do things that aren't protected by discretionary access rights. So we need the ability to limit other methods on the object. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we have capabilities. You can basically create a capability uh, by using the cap new system call to refine an existing file descriptor, and you simply give a new list of writes that you want to allocate. And I don't know, we have sort of 20 or 30 of these writes, and they reflect the different methods that are possible on file descriptors. Anytime you have a capability, you can refine it further to give yourself a new capability with fewer writes. So we allow writes to trickle down and be refined as they go down the process hierarchy. Uh, they're inherited across Fortran exec. You can pass them using Unix domain sockets so that you have the ability to delegate uh, to processes that aren't naturally in the process hierarchy. So you can set up a series of sandboxes which serve objects to each other, uh, which works quite well. Uh, and as I mentioned, we allow uh, directory capabilities using which you can delegate access to subtrees. And this gives us the ability to do what we showed in the Apache picture, uh, in which we say, all right, uh, this process won't have access to the global file system namespace, but we will delegate read access to these configuration files. We'll delegate read and write access to this scratch area, uh, which is a very useful facility. Uh, and as I mentioned, tricky to get correct. So those are the basic primitives. Let's talk about applications for a moment, since I think really this is as much about applications as this is about the operating system. Your average application looks naively something like this. Uh, it does some setup for some work. It accesses some globally available files. It prepares to do a work loop, then executes a work loop, which reads and writes the files and maybe talks to the user and all these other things. Uh, in this world, uh, we can add capability support without too much trouble. We just add cap enter after we've acquired writes to all the files from the global namespace, and then the rest of the work loop uh, executes in capability mode. Uh, this works really well. Uh, programs like TCP dump, it turns out, follow exactly this model. They open the things they need access to, like network interfaces, um, configuration files, and so on. And then they go into a work loop, and they read packets, and they process them, and then they have buffer overflows. Uh, and this allows us to contain TCP dump really quite easily. Uh, unfortunately, not all applications work this way. Uh, if you have an interactive application with a file dialog, or even you know, a complex command line tool, it turns out gzip is a complex command line tool, uh, the work loop doesn't look like that. It's not get all my writes and then process. Uh, and in this kind of situation, uh, we're interested in, in doing something a little bit more complicated. So we provide a higher level API that allows us to create new sandboxes and manage them, uh, delegate writes to them, uh, send them requests, and so on. And this is, uh, looks similar to the kind of things that you would find in Mark with MIG uh, and message generation and so on. They're, we don't provide actually quite as high a level an API as they provide, but something very similar. Uh, and we use this for applications that have more complex structures. So we looked at a lot of different applications. Uh, what we're trying to do, by the way, is, is we're trying to add new primitives to the operating system to support application writers. I think I wouldn't claim we found ideal solutions and APIs for all of those application writers. So we looked at uh, a number of applications. I've mentioned TCP dump, uh, which interacts directly with the system call API. Uh, and with about uh, eight lines of code added, uh, we're able to sandbox TCP dump pretty effectively. Uh, if you compromise TCP dump, you've lost access to all the things that root could otherwise do all over the file system, uh, IPC, and so on. This is, this is great. Um, but it's a very simple application. Uh, we took the uh, OpenBSD DHCP client, which is what FreeBSD uses anyway. They've worked quite hard to provide privilege separation already. 
And so what we wanted to do was see whether we could use capsicum to reinforce that privilege separation, maintain the existing structure, but provide new protections. And we found that there were a number of potential channels of vulnerabilities that could exist, uh, which we were able to close. In particular, um, DHC client relied on using Chirut and alternative UIDs. And these are bypassable for several types of objects in the system, including System 5 IPC. If you get the discretionary access control wrong on System 5 IPC, you can access it straight from uh, the sandbox used for the DHCP client. Uh, so this is problematic. Uh, of course, these are all, uh, you know, uh, moderation techniques, mitigation techniques. So in some sense, you know, it's not catastrophic, but we'd really like to get the mitigation techniques right. Uh, we modified gzip. Uh, this was, a, as I said, a more complex application than we expected. We kind of thought, oh, wouldn't this be the ideal example of, you know, simple input and simple output using file descriptors? A perfect match for capabilities. Uh, not so much. It required quite a lot of work setting up RPCs to forward back and forth. And if, you know, there was one flaw in all of this work, it's the lack of a nice high-level way to translate programmer intent into components that run independently. And we'll Talk more about that in a second as well. Finally, uh, we took Chromium, uh, which has been mentioned already, uh, is already set up to run with multiple processes and, in fact, with sandboxes. Chromium is a really interesting example of an application where you can do a, uh, you know, quite a comprehensive comparison of different sandbox techniques. Uh, it supports, I think, at least six different operating systems and as many uh, different sandbox techniques along the way. So a very, very interesting place to look. So I'll just show you quickly TCP dump, give you a sense of the kind of low-level changes that you might make to an application. Uh, in this example, uh, what we've done is actually we've done four things, and then we've done about uh, twice that much in error checking. Um, what we'd like to do is take existing file descriptors and refine them to be capabilities, so take away writes that aren't necessary. For example, uh, the ability to chmod things that I mentioned earlier. So LC limit FD is actually a library wrapper around cap new uh, that takes care of swapping the file descriptors around and making sure they have the right numbers at the end of it. Uh, then we error out if we're unable to do that. That seems like pretty reasonable behavior. If you can't open your files properly, you should probably exit terminally. And then in the end, we just call cap enter, a single system call, and we've now transitioned uh, from one to the other, from uh, ambient mode to capability mode. Now, there are lots of interesting questions about that. One of the reasons that we have libcapsicum is to ensure that when a sandbox is set up, uh, all capabilities it receives are properly flushed. This means removing file descriptors that have been quietly opened by libraries, uh, removing memory mappings that aren't required. Uh, when you hand modify an application using the sim calls directly as we've done here, that scrubbing has not taken place. And so while this is a very small change, uh, in some ways this is a less robust change than the sorts of changes we've made to higher level applications. Let's talk about Chromium a little more and about the other sandboxing techniques. So I've looked at uh, six different sandboxing techniques implemented, including the one that we added. Uh, and I have carefully selected this table to make Capsicum look really good. So, yeah. <laughs> This is always the case. So uh, what I've done is I've loosely broken them down into in some existing categories. It turns out uh, Capsicum, of course, is not the first capability-like system to come across. Uh, Linux has something called SecComp, which is quite interesting, uh, and offers uh, many weaker services, and that has some implications. Uh, I looked at a couple of manager access control schemes. I looked at uh, the SE Linux changes to Chromium uh, on the Linux platform, uh, and I looked at uh, the sandbox, the seatbelt sandbox, which is used on Mac OS X and how that's integrated. Uh, I have a hand in, in seatbelt because I worked on the Mac framework that's used in Mac OS X. Uh, and I have to say that all of the various sandbox techniques, it, it actually seemed like uh, the best match in the mandatory access control side. The SE Linux stuff, there were some issues with the policy. Uh, and it's not clear to me to what extent they were simply a not particularly well-crafted policy versus uh, expressibility. We'll, we'll say some more. And then there's discretionary access control. Uh, certainly DAC on, on Windows is definitely discretionary access control. Um, Chirut is often treated as discretionary access control. And I put it in that category, although arguably you know, it requires root privilege and things. So it's not quite discretionary in that sense. Uh, so here are a couple of avenues that we can use for comparison. So lines of code. Um, what I did is I took Chromium and I looked at how many lines of code were required for each specific category of sandbox. Uh, these two systems, even though one's capability oriented, one DAC oriented, uh, the SetComp and uh, Windows DAC, uh, each use tens of thousands of lines of code. And in fact, uh, they often use uh, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of lines of handcrafted assembly. Uh, and so they're, they're quite interesting. One of the problems with SetComp uh, is that because it's such a constrained environment, it allows only read and write on file descriptors and a couple of other things along these lines in exit, uh, the authors of Chromium had to forward huge numbers of services into the sandbox. And this is actually what happens in the Windows as well. Uh, and this causes significant problems. It means you grant writes you don't mean to write. In SecComp, for example, the ability to read any file in the file system is passed in. Uh, on Windows, there are a number of problems using discretionary access control. Not only is it easy to get it wrong, um, but there are things that it doesn't constrain. Uh, for example, if you deal with file systems uh, that don't have ACLs on them, such as USB sticks, uh, and that's you know, a significant problem. I don't want to talk too much more about Windows. 
Uh, SE Linux was particularly interesting. Um, it does successfully protect the system, uh, but because of the granularity of the policy and the fact that you have to enumerate all of the different domains when you write the policy, made it quite hard to use SE Linux to provide protection for individual sandboxes. And we found several vulnerabilities, if you will, in the way that the SE Linux sandbox is constructed. Uh, different sandboxes are equated by SE Linux, and therefore they're not protected from each other. Uh, and therefore, if they use IPC primitives, it's possible for different sandboxes to interfere with each other. Now, in Chromium, it turns out right now this isn't a huge problem because they're able to access services that should only be offered to one sandbox anyway because there's a mismatch uh, between the single origin policy at the web level and the internal structure of the web browser. But if you were to fix that mismatch, then that would allow sites to interview with each other and capture each other's screenshots, for example, uh, in the event that one of them sandboxes was compromised. A couple more points. Uh, the use of privilege, uh, that's quite interesting. The fact that both of the major uh, sandbox techniques in Linux required privilege or, or recompiling the kernel is pretty problematic. SetComp does better here, uh, but certainly this is a significant problem. And of course, Capscom does everything right. Um, but we did find actually that the number of lines of code that we had to use to modify it was quite small. Some of those lines of code are because we actually narrow what the existing sandboxes would have represented. Uh, for example, we provide capabilities for things that would previously just have been regular file descriptors. Also, there is actually a lot of code in Chromium to allow privilege separation to have taken place, to pass file descriptors back and forth. Uh, for example, uh, to pass file uh, fonts into sandboxes. It turns out that in Capsicum, we can do it quite a lot better than it's done in Chromium by default, because we can delegate access to subtrees, for example, font directories, uh, and not have to pass each individual one in, which could improve performance. In terms of future work, uh, well, I think this is an interesting platform to build things on. Uh, one of the main areas I think it would be good to do more research in is assisted compartmentalization. This is the analysis of a program to decide what compartments should exist. Uh, so Batao has a very nice system called Wedge, which I think starts to push in this direction in terms of memory analysis, but there's obviously a lot more room for work here. Perhaps the ideal in this space is something like uh, you know, Java, uh, but is restricted for capability work, as done in Joey, uh, where program structure uh, is directly converted into uh, the compartmentalization that occurs in the runtime uh, and the execution environment. Uh, I think for C language applications, we're not going to get anything quite like that, uh, but certainly this is a, a ripe area for investigation. Uh, a question that would be very nice to answer is, once I've selected a decomposition, have I done it right? What sort of analysis tools could we write to solve that problem? Uh, we can immediately apply this in a whole ton of low-level system services, such as routing daemons. Um, but I think the more promising area for investigation is these monolithic applications, applications that contain many, many components and are security aware. Uh, certainly an office suite would be a very interesting place to start to try to apply these principles. Uh, really, when your Word uh, file overflows a buffer inside Microsoft Word, you'd like if it had access only to its own file, as opposed to everything else running in your desktop environment. I think there's a, a lot of ground to be covered there. Uh, more generally and philosophically, I mentioned this interesting question of how you map distributed security policies into local security, and that's really what Capsicum is about as a primitive, but we need to think about all the potential applications of this kind of approach. Uh, another area in the long term that's interesting, and we push a little bit in this direction in our work, we have a version of Qt, uh, Qt4, uh, which provides power boxes based on Capsicum. So we could, for example, modify KDE uh, to allow file dialogues to run with full ambient privilege and constrain individual applications to run without it. So just to wrap up, uh, we've seen this transition from multi-user security to compartmentalized applications. I think this is a healthy transition, but it's put a lot of stress on the access control facilities that we have. Uh, our APIs are faster, cleaner, and more secure. I haven't argued uh, faster for you. In some sense, faster is irrelevant because these application orders have already decided that they're going to do privilege separation, so they've accepted the overhead. It turns out our primitives are faster, um, but it almost doesn't matter. Uh, we've taken a very delegation-centric approach to a granular policy. I think this makes life a bit easier for us than SE Linux. Certainly writing the policies, it seemed to be that we got them more right than the SE Linux policy, but it's hard to evaluate that in a really empirical way, I think. Uh, but we can, we can certainly make claims there. We've done something interesting. We've avoided dual coding. Uh, so in SE Linux, you have the separate uh, policy from the uh, content of the application. And we've argued this is good because it allows your application to drive the creation of policies it runs. But of course, there are downsides. You can't do a static analysis on it easily. It's not isolated from the implementation that allows a more refined analysis. So this is a, this is a trade off as opposed to necessarily a simple plus. But we have eliminated the privilege requirement, which is a very good thing. Uh, we see this as supplementing mandatory and access control uh, and discretionary access control. They can live in the same system fine. There are interesting composition questions as always. Uh, we have an implementation based on FreeBSD 9. We backported it to FreeBSD 8. Uh, shortly, we'll release patches against FreeBSD 8.1. Uh, Google also has a port uh, under the way to port to Linux. They have the kernel primitives running. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how much farther they can take that. So with that, I'll wrap up, and if I have a couple of minutes for questions. Sure. Uh, I just ask people to keep, uh, keep it to one question per person. <laughs>
A uh, quick, quick question. I was very uh, intrigued with, with, with your, your uh, earlier comment, comment about, about the dichotomy, dichotomy uh, between, between type enforcement and, and mandatory access. access. Uh, it, it seems, seems that, that we, we tried, tried to do both of them in, 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 in the Brewery Street operating, operating system, system in the 70s, and, and, right. and, and it, was it was okay. okay. It worked. Yeah, yeah I, think I think that's my feeling, too. I think they actually, actually do compose quite well. well. Uh, I think where it would get more complicated is where we try to deploy capabilities in service of things that we're already constraining with type enforcement in a granular way. way. So, so in, for example, uh, in, in subdividing system, system applications, we're also using type enforcement side by side. But I agree, I think uh, there's no reason you shouldn't impose nicely. If you'd like to transfer the timeline on capabilities, might be 30 years as well. So we'll see. Next question. Hi, uh, hello, I'm from, from Microsoft Research. research. Uh, I think uh, capability-based uh, sandboxing process sandboxing is definitely the right, right way to go. go. A lot of the significant challenges come from um, the backward compatibility. compatibility. Uh, whether you know, things, things like Chromium, Chromium can really uh, run well, well on your system. system. Uh, another, another point I'd like to uh, basically come on, there, there are some uh, uh, YSOIL browser, browser architecture earlier where you have a browser process with ambient. Uh, with, with a lot, lot of MVP authority, authority, where you, you have a strictly sandboxed uh, render process. process. Uh, that, that architecture is very, very much the same as the Gazelle browser architecture, architecture that, that we presented at last, last using security. security. Uh, and also, also your, your observation of where, you know, how the world, world have migrated from a Mate user um, OS to, um, you know, a you know, Mate machine, machine user kind of setting. Uh, this, this has also been observed in our service OS project. Which Absolutely. We've, we've actually, actually just, just simply adopted the model that was already present, present in Chromium for sandboxing. sandboxing. Uh, I think, I think I, it's I easy to argue that, in fact, you want to do much more sandboxing, sandboxing than is present in Chromium today. today. Certainly another, another weakness, weakness in the structure that we presented is, is what, what do you do about the windowing system? Uh, so, so one of the reasons yes, exactly. so, so much privilege in, 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 in the Gazelle work and service OS work that we have explored, you expect the situation where you know, the, the principles are embedding content from, from one another. another. And that, that has implications on both the display and resource management. Right, and I think we've still seen that come out of some of the other capabilities we work in the last decade or two. Uh, for example, uh, the Docker browser really brings out a lot of those aspects. Absolutely, as well as the ROS work, which we also have dealt with the display. But there are some special uh, scenarios in the web application scenario which we brought out. Yeah, and I think the other observation made, which is that, you know, this is. It's, it's kind, kind of time, time for all this stuff. stuff. I think that's right. right. One, One of the interesting things that's happened with mobile, mobile phone security, I think it's actually very exciting, exciting is that on smartphones, OS vendors have selected to break compatibility with existing application models in order to add security. security. So, so in Android, uh, in iPhone, and various, various others, others you know, there's been an explicit design choice to say, no, no applications from the old environment will work directly, they have to be modified, and one of the design assumptions will be more security. Uh, and I, think I think that's great, and I think we should keep doing it. Well, I think the web browser has got a lot of things correct. For example, the same margin policy, that has implied you know, the right principle model. Where okay. I don't want to the rest of the system yeah, yeah. Ward, but, 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 but I'm going to have to. I just want to give everybody yeah, a chance to ask a question. The good news is there's lots more research to do, so we'll all be employed for a while. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Tim, Tim, Tim Howey from, from Florida International University in Miami. Uh, so, um, how uh, do you handle the revocation of the capabilities right. in this system? So, revocation is an interesting question uh, with capabilities. So, uh, we kind of support two kinds of capabilities. We have these system-centric capabilities, which are effectively a fast path to the kernel. Uh, and, and this allows our system to get the kind of performance you'd really like to get, native file access performance. And then when we support these user-based user capabilities, these are really just IPC sockets that allow messages, messages to get back, passed back and forth, and they, they can represent services or objects or whatever you choose. And this is kind of a standard capability operating system approach. Uh, in the capability world, revocation is usually done using interposition. You have a wrap around the underlying object that allows you to say, okay, as of this time, or as of this policy change, or whatever it may be, we're going to restrict access. And the capabilities you have will not disappear, but it will no longer be useful. Because, because we have, have a fast path, path into the, the kernel, kernal, we do we not, not allow interposition on some kinds of objects. So, so we need to be able to allow memory, memory mapping files, for example. So, so we actually pass, pass the file around, around. We, have we have no way to provide revocation to that, that currently. currently. We're very, very interested in providing interposition. We're very, very careful about how you do interposition. Uh, systems like Mock did allow wrapping uh, objects that could be memory mapped. Uh, so it uh, 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 uses space pages and so on, by that. You can certainly imagine doing that here. But I think the consequences of that are non-trivial. I've had to talk about very carefully. You could, you could also imagine modifying what we have now to allow a revocation of delegated capabilities using a specific kernel mechanism. We have not done that as yet. Thank you. Um, Chris Cowan, Microsoft, and, and I'm going to ask a Linux, Linux question. Um, you, you spent a bunch of time, time talking about SE Linux and didn't mention AppArmor. Uh, 
AppArmor had the change hat system API specifically to do what you're talking about. It would allow an app to decompose itself in multiple right. domains. Uh, so I'd be interested in your take on that. Right. I think um, AppArmor and, and the Mac OS X seatbelt system, system are actually very similar, similar, similar in many ways in terms, in terms of how they allow policies to be signed to applications and so on. Uh, I, I think those are both very interesting systems. systems. I wouldn't uh, denigrate them. I would say that, that I think that the capabilities of your own structure, whether they're implemented in our system, in Capsicum, or implemented, implemented using, using a system like, like, uh, like, like AppArmor makes a lot of sense. sense. Uh, I, think I think being, being able, able to refine file descriptors is very useful, and being able to provide a very effective default denial of low-level namespace has a lot of value. So that kind of approach is a good idea. Thanks. Let's thank the uh, speaker one more time.